Welcome back everybody to another video. In this video, I am going to show you how I made a really cool shot mallet off of a piece of clip art that I downloaded off the internet. It, I got this idea from a double-sided, double-edged battle axe. I thought it might be kind of cool to make a mallet that, that replicated an axe head. So I made the handle out of Purple Heart I did a two-sided carve. I'm going to go over that briefly with you on how I did the handle. Um, molding tool paths for the edges on both sides. Um, the inside here is maple and then the outside is black walnut. So I'm going to head out to the shop out here and I'm going to get the lumber milled up. I'm going to show you how I made it. So I recently picked up a good bit of Purple Heart off of Facebook Marketplace. This particular piece that I'm using now is two inches thick and my saw really, really had to work to get through it. I could do about a, about a little less than a quarter inch each pass on it and it was bogging it down. Um, I had no idea that Purple Heart was this hard of a wood. I knew it was hard, I just didn't know it was that hard. So I did finally end up getting through it and as you'll see here it finally goes through after I think it's nine passes that it took to actually get through it. So I bring it back into the CNC room and I put on my one inch surfacing bit and I start surfacing it to make it good and flat. I slowed the speed down just a little bit and I took a little less material off. Uh, I believe I was doing uh, a little less than a sixteenth of an inch at about 60 inches a minute on there. You can see the washers that I use. Uh, make sure, guys, whenever you're putting, uh, whenever you're surfacing wood, um, you know, on your table, very rarely is it ever going to be flat to start with on one side. There's always going to be a little bit of a of a wiggle to it. Um, what I use is some very very thin, I believe they're one inch or inch and a quarter stainless washers, and I just tuck however many I need up underneath the piece there to keep it from wobbling. It's very important when you're surfacing. So the next step is bring it over to the joiner. Um, I bought this little Rikon joiner uh, about six, eight months ago with a helical head. And I think for being the size it is, it actually does a really, really good job. I'm very happy with it. One of these days I'll upgrade and get a little bit wider one, but for now it's, uh, it's served me just fine. I believe it took uh, five or six passes to get that perfectly flat. I was taking uh, about a 30 second off at a time here. Um, very important guys, keep, keep that flat edge that we surfaced on the CNC machine or if you planed it, however you did it, always put that against your fence. If you have to mark it so you don't forget, mark it. But generally it's pretty easy to tell. So now that we have the one edge nice and flat, we head over to the bandsaw. I picked up this bandsaw about a year and a half ago. It's a Laguna BX-22. It's my absolute favorite woodworking tool in my entire garage. I use it more than just about anything. The resaw capacity on it is 16 inches, and I've actually done that um, a couple of times on white oak, and it saws like butter, just like this Purple Heart saws like butter. I got the one inch Laguna uh, resaw blade in there. And it does absolutely phenomenal. So I have my uh, edge that I surfaced on the CNC machine against the fence and then the edge that I did on the joiner on the base plate. Uh, my wife actually bought me that feather board uh, from Rockler for Christmas. I absolutely love that as well. It's meant primarily for uh, resawing. You can actually get an extension to make it a little bit taller. Uh, that I don't have, which I haven't found a need for it. It seems to hold it pretty good there uh, without it being any taller. If memory serves me correct at Rockler, it was like 80 or $90 for that feather board. Um, it's a little pricey, but in my opinion, it's much safer and it really helps keep your stock up tight against the fence and makes it a lot, lot safer to resaw.
So the resaw turned out beautiful. It actually looked like I already sanded it, but I didn't. That's how smooth it cuts with a good sharp blade. I went ahead and cut the stock down to five inches, so I had two pieces to work with, because eventually I am going to make another mallet, so I figured I might as well have uh, another one ready when it comes time. Back into the CNC room, um, I put in the hog roughing bit from IDC Woodcraft. It's my favorite roughing bit. As I'm doing the first roughing here, um, I'm doing a pass depth of an eighth of an inch, which is 0.125 on this. Um, normally on softer woods, even walnut, I've done on my long mill, which is some people will say it's probably overkill for it, but I've never had a problem cutting a quarter inch with the hog roughing bit in one pass at like 70 to 80 inches per minute, which is very aggressive, but that hog bit chews through it, no problem. Um, so like I said, pass depth of 0.125. I was running it right now at 60 inches per minute. And I believe the plunge I also did at 60. You can, you can plunge really fast with that hog bit as well. So the roughing pass finished fine, no issues at all. I'm switching over here to the uh, quarter inch ball nose bit. The only thing you have to re-zero is the Z height. Obviously your X and Y is gonna be the same. So there's no reason to do that. So my finishing bit I'm running here at 80 inches per minute with a plunge of 40 and I'm doing a 10% step over that seemed to give me a pretty good finish if I was to do maybe six or seven percent it would have done it just a little bit finer but you can see there it's pretty it's pretty smooth when I plan on sanding it anyway um, the difference in time between going from six or seven percent to ten percent is actually pretty substantial on this I want to say it was uh, about 20 minutes um, 20 minutes or 30 minutes longer of a carve. So sometimes you have to weigh your carve of the time versus an extra minute of sanding. It, it, sometimes it's just not worth it for that super duper fine step over, unless you're doing like a very intricate, like 3d relief carve, then it's super important, but something like this is not nearly as important. All right, guys, there's the final side. It has just a tiny, tiny bit of material left. I can actually push it through with my fingernail to cut that out. So we're going to go out here with the uh, multi-tool and get this thing cut out and see how, uh, how the two sides lined up. Turned out pretty good. It is almost perfectly lined up. Get this thing cleaned up and see how it looks. So I sped up the sanding a good bit here just because it's not that fun to watch. I picked up this rigid sander a couple of years ago from Home Depot and it served me well. It's pretty nice because you can actually take the, uh, 
the belt off of it, that whole top mechanism that's going up and down, and it came with a separate spindle. So if you want to use it as a single spindle sander with different size, uh, has different size rubber, I guess, bushings you'd call them for, for different size um, sandpaper for different diameters. Um, I generally keep it on this one because I can actually use the ends of it, you know, for uh, doing radiuses and stuff like that, like I'm doing right there. Um, but it is an, a decent little a decent little sander uh, price point. I don't remember what I paid for it. I want to say it was around 300 bucks somewhere in there. Uh, 250 300 I might have got it like on a Black Friday deal or something. But it's done me pretty well. Alright guys, so... Just got off the belt sander with it. I got almost all these edges pretty close to being flush with the rest of the handle. Um, I picked up some of these new pads for my sander off of Amazon and they allow you to do a lot of these curves because they smush. So that way you don't get a lot of straight lines. So I'm gonna head out there to the other part of my garage. I have a downdraft table because with this pad on here, the suction doesn't work and I try to keep this room a little bit dust free so head out there if you guys don't have one of those sanding sponges that go on your uh, orbital sander you definitely need to get one anything that's that you're sanding that's not square and makes it a breeze it was definitely the tool of choice for for doing this uh round or oval shaped handle it worked uh very very well all right guys moving right along I got this piece of one inch walnut up here that I'm going to make the sides of the mallet with. It's got a ton of cracks and a ton of knots. So I found two good areas I'm going to cut. One down here in the corner and the other one up here. So we're going to make it work. I'm doing the molding tool path now on uh, both of the walnut uh, left and right side of the head of the mallet. I'm using the quarter inch ball nose again. Uh, my depth of pass is an eighth of an inch, 0.125. I'm doing a 10% step over. Uh, my feed rate is 80 inches per minute with a plunge of 40 inches per minute on this walnut. And it's, it's cutting perfect. It might be a little bit on the uh, conservative side. I could probably bump it up to 100 inches a minute. Um, I think the max that my CNC machine will do is around 120 inches a minute. But it just depends on your depth of pass. At an eighth inch, I could have sped it up a little bit, but I'd rather not uh, take the chance on it skipping a step or, or something like that. So I tend to tune it down just a tiny bit. The holes that I'm cutting here, I switched the bit again uh, off camera. The dowel holes are three quarters of an inch in diameter. I'm doing a uh, quarter inch upcut uh, end mill here. I'm doing another uh, eighth inch depth of pass on that 80 inches per minute with a 45 inch per minute plunge and a 40 percent step over with that bit and it did just fine all right guys came into the house this purple heart after it sat last night i, I cut the video off last night i got tired it still has a it ha still has a pretty good purple hue to it. I actually put it in the sun just for a little bit. You can see it pulled out a lot of the oils and stuff in this. At least I don't know if you can see that. All these grain lines here, you can see they got a little bit uh, sticky. A little bit of the oil came out of it just from leaving it in the sun. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw it in the little oven here at 350 for an hour. And hopefully when it comes out, it should be a lot darker purple than that. And uh, once it comes out, I'm going to let it cool, and I got a can of uh, spray lacquer out there. I'm going to give it a good lacquer finish. And uh, I'm going to lacquer basically the handle and the top that you're going to see. I'm not going to spray uh, the sides here because that's going to get glued. So I'm gonna, I'll am gonna throw it in the oven and see you in an hour. Hopefully it comes out a lot darker. All right, while the wood's in there cooking, we're going to get these tabs cut on the sides of the mallet here. Amazing how much easier that cuts than that purple heart, man. That purple heart is some hard, hard wood. <laughs> hard wood.
All right, we got the flush trim bit in here. We're gonna flush trim this up, get rid of these little tabs. Thing turned out really good, actually. That molding tool path looks really cool. Kind of gives it like a extra dimension of style. One mistake I made here real quick, guys, when I did the other half of the uh, mallet head, I got a little too close to the corner on the second one and a little chunk chipped out of it. It wasn't a big deal for this project, but keep that in mind if you're ever doing a flush trim bit, especially on those sharper corners. Um, they do chip very easy. It's better to stop a little short of them and uh, hit it with some sandpaper or something instead of ruining your, your project. So keep that in mind. So I just flipped it and the oils have really came out of that side. You see how pretty dark, dark, dark purple it is. I actually just wiped a lot of it off with a paper towel. I had no idea there's going to be this much oil that came out of this thing. It's not moisture. I mean, it's moisture because it's an oil, but it's, it's not like water moisture. I tested this wood before I cut it and it was only at like three or 4%. So, well, you could see the difference on that side when I just flipped it, how pretty purple that is now. I'll probably give it like another 15 minutes and hopefully it'll be about right. Let's see if it's done. Oh, she's steaming. Oh, look at that. Oh, that got so freaking dark. Come bring that camera up here. The lighting's not the greatest in here, but. That is too hot to handle. Yeah, it's a little warm. <laughs> oh, goodness. What happened? What does that do? I'm not sure. <laughs> like baking the, the moisture, maybe? No, it's, there's not a whole, it wasn't a whole lot of moisture in this. It's pulling the oils out from what I understand. So do you have to put it back in because that side didn't? No. It, it'll darken it up too once I put a finish on it, but I'm gonna let this thing, I'm gonna let it cool for a little while and then I'm gonna put about three coats of lacquer on it. And hopefully it seals in that color and it stays purple. From what I understand, I've done a lot of research on Purple Heart because every time I've used it, it never stays the color. And I guess there's really no way to actually forever keep the color in it. So the only thing you can do is try to keep it out of the sun as much as possible. And then do, if you're gonna be using something out, outdoors using Purple Heart, you really need to use like a spar polyurethane with UV blockers in it. This is gonna be used inside, so I'm not worried about it. Um, that's why I just chose the, uh, to go with the uh, lacquer, spray lacquer route on just, just the handle. So the rest of it, I'll probably just do like an oil finish like I do on my other videos for the sides of the mallet and then the, uh, the inner pieces are going to be uh, maple, so all that will just be finished with a regular oil finish. But I'm pretty happy with it. It'll lighten up a little bit probably, but it's definitely it's definitely purple again. This light, it's bright as it is in here, it just doesn't pick up light. But it definitely darkened it up a ton from what it was when I put it in there. It's beautiful. That is hot! <laughs> Good idea on the use of the tongs. Yeah, thanks wife. I was just gonna grab it with my napkin, but. <laughs> He's got sensitive hands. Okay. See the purple even coming off on the, the oil? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, very There's pretty. a couple places that has some splotchiness to it, but. It's very pretty. It's okay. Another thing you have to do is, um, once this cools, it's, it's the same as like watering it down. It pops the grain. You need to go back over it again. I'm probably going to use like a 400-ish grit sandpaper and just re-smooth re it out again. It still feels pretty smooth, but I'm still going to do it just because. <laughs> so all I did was just mark my center line. I laid this across here so I can have a straight edge to mark off of. The diameter or the uh, the width of this on my calipers was uh, 2.6 inches. So I just marked my center line. I'm gonna go over 
three inches each way so I know exactly where the center mark is so I know exactly where this has to be so when I cut my maple blocks I know where they gotta go She picked up these, <clears throat> I picked up these squares. It was a set of two, a mechanical pencil and everything off of Amazon. They're the eye gauging brand. I absolutely love them. Absolutely love these squares. And they are, oh God, way, way cheaper than woodpecker stuff, man. That, that company, boy, they are proud of their stuff. My goodness. I like to have nice tools, but to spend $150, $200 on a set of squares is, to me, is a little... Out of my budget, that's for darn sure. So this set here, it came with this one. Actually, let me grab it for you. I'll show you what I got. Came with the two size different squares, pencil and uh, refills. It was, uh, I believe like $65 for the whole set. So I think the equivalent in the Woodpecker brand would have been over 200, so. And these work for my talent, my skill level. These are more than fine. They draw lines. <clears throat> Perfecto. Start to see this thing coming along. I think it's gonna be pretty cool looking when it's done. It'll be cool looking whether it works good or not, who knows. So what I'm doing is just laying this outside face here on the mallet head where it's going to be and I'm going to mark just the top part of this dowel hole. That way I can see exactly where that dowel is going to be because what I'm going to do I'm only going to put a slit in this with a bandsaw from right from right here right above that hole down or up I guess that would be up so I'm going to come in with a bandsaw and cut me a line right here for when I put my wedge in there <clears throat> but I'm also going to go out before I cut my um before I cut this right here, I'm gonna drill about an eighth inch hole right here where I want the thing to stop so it has a little bit more of expansion when I pound a, a little skinny wedge in there. And if I was gonna do this again, I would probably move this dowel hole down just a little bit more so I have more room. But in all reality, once this thing is glued together and, and with these two outside dowels, I probably would never even have needed this middle one. But this is the first one I've ever made, and so it's kind of an experiment. See what I like, what I don't like. So, and, and I'm not going to be using like a sledgehammer either. So a lot of people are like, oh, when you laminate these, you know, they'll come apart. And I got news for you. That glue is harder than most woods when it dries. So you'd really, really have to be abusing this thing to get it to, to come apart, especially with these three quarter inch maple dowels. That's going to be going all the way through everything. So I just don't ever see that coming apart, but Time will tell. Let's go out with the bandsaw and cut this thing.
So after cutting this uh, notch in the handle, I realized later on when I went to assemble this thing that it wasn't quite big enough. So what I did was I just measured over from my blade, uh, the center, and I went about a 16th each way and just V'd it down to that center hole. Uh, it gave me about an eighth inch gap, uh, a V at the top and tapered down to the hole that I drilled. That way I could get a little bit bigger wedge in there. I don't, I'm not real sure what I was thinking only doing a blade width. It just wasn't going to cut it. Got the slot cut in that for the for a little wedge and in all actuality this is going to be more for probably just looks it's with all the glue and the dowels it's probably not going to do a whole lot but I'm going to do a contrasting color in the top to kind of give it a cool look on the top of it so anyway I'm using 320 grit I'm just going to go over this thing one more time before we do the finish on it I'm going to do three coats of this is the Minwax, the lacquer, clear aerosol. No sand in between coats, 30 minutes to recoat. So I'll do three coats on just this, but I'm not going to um, put any on this face here. That's where the glue is going to be. three coats on the handle. This thing turned out absolutely beautiful. The, the, I know the camera doesn't do it justice with the lighting. It does look a little bit more orange maybe in the camera, but it, it's a deep purple and it is absolutely gorgeous. I couldn't be happier with the way that handle turned out. All right guys, so I made a little bit of a boo-boo. Not a big boo-boo, but you can see how I had to tape this off right here. So when I went to mock up these blocks of how they're going to be glued on here so this is going to be obviously like that and those are going to be on the sides each side this part of the mount was not perfectly flat and i should have checked it after i was done doing the two-sided car but i didn't I, I just assumed it was flat so what i had to do was i took this piece of maple and just did the um, tape method super glued it down tape on this tape on the back side of this this side was actually was perfect and I super glued this down on there and then just used my quarter inch end mill and went back and forth to reflatten this. But when I did, it left a little bit of a line here. So I had to sand all this to blend it in as good as I could. And you can't really, you won't be able to tell once it's, once it's assembled, but this side is a, dips in just a little more right here than this side, but I'm not a pro. So anyway, that's why. It doesn't look the same as the last time I turned the camera on because I just taped this off right here not to mess up this part of the finish. And once I finish this, it'll probably be close to that again. If not, it's just going to be a little bit of a two-tone, but it's a shop hammer for myself, so I really don't care. All right, guys, so I clamp this right where it needs to be, right dead nuts in the center, flat on the top. I'm going to glue these side pieces on first, the maple. They're going to be glued on. Uh, both sides here. Oops. Both sides, and you can see they're not. It's not going to be even. This isn't perfect. So what I'm going to do is just clamp this down to my table. Once this glue's dry, and I'm just going to resurface this on the uh, CNC machine to make this perfectly flat. Once this glue is dry on here.
So what I did here was I actually uh, used the masking tape and super glue method and stuck this whole thing down on a scrap piece of plywood I had. I double side put it one piece of double sided tape right here under this handle just to hold hold that flat. And I put my one inch surfacing bit in here so that way I can go over this thing. I'm going to manually jog it um, and just surface this uh, maple down to be perfectly flush with the handle. Um, in hindsight, I obviously should have done this first. <laughs> I should have made sure the maple was perfect. I didn't. Like I said, I'm not the best woodworker in the world. I'm learning. So this is how I'm going to do it. And it will work. I'm applying some tight bond three here to both sides, real light coats on both surfaces, one on the maple and then on the walnut. I've always been a man to spread glue with my finger until my lovely wife bought me that really cool glue spreader from Rockler for Christmas. She did really good this past year. I know this, I know we're way past Christmas now, but when I filmed this video, this part of it, it was, uh, like I said earlier, it was like the end of December, early January, so I haven't got around to finishing it until now. But if you guys made it to this part in the video, I really appreciate it. I'm really trying to uh, better my CNC videos. I've got the fishing videos pretty much down pat. Me and my wife have that down to a science now. But if you would, like, subscribe, shoot me a comment, a nice comment. If you leave me a bad comment, a negative comment, or you're just being mean, I'm going to delete you. You will be banned forever, and I won't lose sleep over it. So be nice. I do take uh, constructive criticism pretty well though. Just don't be mean about it. Not that big of a deal. I ended up just putting that three quarter inch dowel through the center hole there to help keep the parts aligned while I clamp them. They were wanting to squish around and slide a little bit as I was trying to clamp it. So it took a little bit longer than I thought to get them uh, lined up. I have heard guys using a little bit of sawdust or something uh, in the glue to help it from sliding around so much, but I didn't do that here. I ended up getting it. Um, here in a couple minutes, I am going to move on to using the Vetric Aspire software. A very brief Vetric Aspire uh, demo on the tool pass that I used and stuff like that for the molding. I am not going to get into the 3D modeling portion of the handle on this video. It's already gone on quite long enough. <coughs> If you guys are interested in, in how I did that handle, I can do another video. It's not that big of a deal. I'm just not going to do it on this one. I believe I mentioned before I am going to leave the files um, so you can download them uh, in the description below or in the comments, wherever I got to put them so you guys can download them. I can't remember. That way you can tinker with them. I saved uh, the 3D model as an STL file. That way if you have vCarve, and you don't have a spire, you can still download it if you want to try to make it yourself. Um, I will include the Aspire files as well for guys that have it. So stay tuned to the end if you want to see the uh, Aspire portion of this. So another thing that I would do different, which I will do different eventually, I'm not going to redo it now. This is going to work fine for my needs. What I'm probably going to end up doing is taking the bandsaw and cutting up and just cutting this one smaller all the way around um, it, it'll make it uh, roughly about an inch um, an inch shorter another thing I would probably do different too is my outside pieces of walnut I did at one inch thick I'd probably go down to like three quarter or maybe half inch thickness so it's not so bulky this way I mean it does look cool uh, the handle especially I'm super happy with the way the handle came out doing a two-sided carve on that there's tons of people that make these mallets on, on the internet and they just do a basic cut and then they sand and form it, which is fine, it works, but I enjoy using the, the CNC trying new things. So my original plan on this was to use three quarter inch dowels to run all the way through 
just to give it a contrasting look. It looked, you know, I think it looked pretty neat. On the smaller mallet that I'm gonna make, this is three quarter inch brass. And I think this is gonna add a little bit of weight to the area you're gonna be pounding on. So that's an option for you guys as well too. I think that's gonna look really cool with the brass contrast in there as well. Um, my plan is I'm gonna go ahead and sand this and make it more of like a dome shape, a very slight dome shape on this. So when this is coming through the hole here, I'm gonna have it a little bit proud of this surface just so you can see that little bit of a, of a dome shape on the brass. I think it'll look kind of cool. So that's probably what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do probably the maple dowel in these and then I'll probably cut this brass down and do the outside holes once I cut this smaller on the bandsaw which you're not going to see me do just don't use your imagination it'll be smaller um, but like I said that's the uh, that's one thing I got to get better at um, when I design something on the computer it looks great it looks scale it looks nice until you actually cut it out put it together and I'm like okay this isn't that great it looks cool but it's not very practical it needs to be smaller so Anyway, let's jump back on the computer and um, I'll show you what else I did for the files that I'm going to include. All right, so I'm going to show you guys real quick um, how I took a clip art of a double edged battle axe clip art and I'm going to trace it and that's how I got my design idea to make the shot mallet. <laughs> you're just going to go to file, you're going to go to import, you're going to import a bitmap. That's uh, and it's an image file, so it'll be a bitmap. Scroll down till I find it. Okay, so this was the clip art that I used to make the mallet head. I'm going to show you guys how I did it here. Um, I didn't use the handle. I'll cut that out and this top part. All I kept was just this top part. So what we're going to do is go right here. Uh, Shift Z. Does that zoom? Yeah. It takes me a minute to remember how to zoom. So this little bird icon here, that's going to be your trace bitmap, okay? So we're going to click that. Because the image is like, it's blurred, it's not the grade of an image, um, I did have to turn up the number of the threshold of the colors um, to get it to where it's not so zigzag when it traces it. So anyway, that's the only thing I changed on that because the uh, pixelation was is horrible on this, on this image. So we'll preview that. And we're going to apply. We're going to go up here to our layers. I'm going to turn the bitmap layer off and we're left just with our vector line that we created. So what we're going to do is we're going to join this section of the axe head to this section. By that we're going to be using an arc tool. We're going to click right in this neighborhood. Oh, my snapping's not on. Make sure your snapping's on so you uh, hit your existing line. And click there. We're going to come over right about the same distance and click there. Now we're going to arc this up just ever so slightly so it stays with that contour right here in the middle and then click again. All right, so we just use the arc tool. That's all we did. And while I already have the arc tool on, I'm going to do the same thing up here to get rid of to get rid of this uh, top portion up here that we don't want. <clears throat> and I'm just eyeballing it, guys. It does go down slightly, but it's uh, not enough to where it's going to be real noticeable. All right. Now that we got our lines done we have our uh, basically our axe head done for the most part. I'm going to show it what else I did to it though. Grab your trim tool and we're going to trim that, trim that. So all we're left with is the uh, the head of the axe and one more thing we have to do on each side of this. Uh, we're going to use the line tool one more time but we're going to use the straight line tool. It says draw line, polyline. That's what we're going to use for this. We're going to go right here in the corner, as close to the corner as we can get it. We're going to click and then scroll up here to the top. 
and we're going to go right here to this corner. At least I think I'm in the corner. We're pretty, pretty close to it. All right, we click there, hit Escape to get off that tool. Because we don't want, at least I don't want a rounded mallet. So that's why we're going to go ahead and cut these out as well. Trim that. And we're going to do the same thing over here. Get right here, right in the corner, right in that general area. Close that out, get the scissors, and we'll cut that. So that's what we're left with is a basic looking modified clip art axe head. All right, so this is the file that I'm going to include um, in the description below if you guys want to download it and tinker with it. As I was saying, this is the original size that I did. It was right around eight inches. And whenever I put the, let me show you what I'm doing here. So when I originally designed this, putting this over the handle, it actually looks really proportioned and good. So this is a fine example, just because you des design something on a computer and you, and you think it looks great and it's going to be amazing, it, it doesn't mean that it is. So until you actually physically hold it in your hand, it's not great. Th this, this head is way too big, I, I think. Some people may not think so, but I think it is. So I just basically reduced the size of it and made this smaller one. This one here is, I believe it was right about uh, six inches across, roughly. Yeah, right about six inches across on that one. And when I put this one up to the handle originally, before I did it, it looked way too little. Um, <clears throat> so looking at that, it looks kind of, it'd be down here at the bottom and you'd have to cut the top of that handle off. But look, looking at that, it looks kind of silly to me. It looks unproportioned, but in reality, this would be honestly the way better way to go with this. I think, unless you really, for some reason, needed a really big head on the mallet. Um, but on this file, if you guys choose to use this design, I would probably go with the the smaller of the two. One other thing you guys are going to want to do is, you'll notice that when you click right here after you've modified this, it's going to be in multiple vectors here. Um, you want to select everything, left click and hold, select everything, and you want to go right down here to uh, your join, join open vectors. It's the uh, kind of rectangle looking one with the points on it. You're going to want to click that, tolerance point, that's fine, because they're, they're already almost touching, and you want to hit join. So now you have all one, all one continuous vector. In this video, I'm not going to go crazy in depth on molding toolpaths. There's there's plenty of videos out there that explain it, uh, probably better than I can explain it. The way I do it is I set up two guides. So <clears throat> if this distance between, let me zoom here so you can see what I'm looking at. So on this bottom bigger axe head, uh, the one that I cut out, this distance from this line to this line is exactly a half of an inch. So that's how big you want your... I don't know what you call that. I guess your profile of the mold of the molding path. That's the just a little design that I did. It's got a slight arc to it just with a straight line up. So let me show you guys. <clears throat> Actually, I'll probably do a close up on the on the other camera. So scrap that idea. I'll do a close up on the other camera to show you the close up of that molding tool path. So the smaller axe head is this distance all right so you would need you know if you want to I, I can actually what i'll do is i'll i'll copy this and i'll make it to where it fits both and whatever accent you guys want to use if you choose to use either one of them you'll already have the the template up here for the molding tool path but this one currently is set up to fit in this smaller distance whereas if i stretch this to this other guide it'll be exactly a half inch and fit inside of this one so I will leave this. This will be up here, obviously. So if you guys want to use this file, you can. I did 
save uh, the 3D handle. Let me go to my preview here. <clears throat> Actually, I don't need to show you on the camera. Duh, I can show you right here. So that molding that I did is this uh, taper right here, that little design. That, that's what makes this here and here. Um, what was I saying? So I saved the 3D file. Um, I export it as an STL for guys that don't have Vetric Aspire. If you choose that you want to use it, you can. Um, it, I just saved it as a 3D model. Um, and then for guys that do have Aspire, I saved uh, it all on one. So you guys can download it. That way, if you, if you don't like the handle the way it is, you at least have the option to modify it. So one thing that's super important, I've actually had a couple people email me off of, uh, I, mean, I don't have it, I think this will be my fourth video, but I've had a few people email me wanting my, um, I don't remember what files it was. I think it was maybe the uh, cappuccino cup holder one that I built, um, one of my first videos. They're wanting my G code, and they're they were brand new to to CNC. And <clears throat> guys, please do not use. Just don't plug in my my save this as as G code and run it in your machine. I know it might sound dumb to people that's been doing this a while, but. Some people are new and just don't know. Um, my machine's most likely gonna be different than yours. My bits may be different. Um, I, I'm gonna leave these in here. That way, if you wanna see what bits I use and everything, that's fine. But just a word of caution, don't ever use someone else's G code. Always make sure that the feeds and speeds are right and, and everything is, is good and make your own G code. And like I said, that, that, that sounds pretty stupid, but um, you know, I, I didn't know when I when I very very first started CNC. I, I didn't you know I didn't know. I don't want to make anybody feel feel dumb, but um, I'm just telling you, don't use other people's G code. Look look at their their tool paths and then modify them to fit your machine. So anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. I want to thank everybody for watching this video. If you have any questions, make sure you hit me up in the comments. Shoot me a like, subscribe. I really, really appreciate it being a new channel. It helps out a lot. Um, if you like, remember, if you like fishing, fishing videos, boating, catch and cook videos, check out my wife and I's other channel. It's called Living Naughty, N-A-U-T-I. And until the next one, thank you very much.